Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour, wherever you are and however you're tuning in. We're always glad to have you along. Our first request is an oldie but a goodie, hymn 341, To God Be the Glory. And a good friend of ours, Ignacio, in Chile has requested it. So we will sing all three verses of hymn 341. special request, please visit us at our website at sackcentral.org. Click on the contact us link and be sure to tell us where you're from. We always love hearing from you wherever you are in the world and especially the notes that you include. Choose a song in the hymnals and we'll sing them with you in the coming Sabbaths. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here worshiping you and giving you all of the glory this morning. We ask, Lord, for your blessings as we um, continue in your word um, about Paul, um, learning how he walked with you and for you. And we ask that uh, your blessing will also be with Pastor Chris, um, that the words that he speak may be yours, and that we might be changed by them. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Our lesson study this morning will be brought to us by Pastor Chris Budry, our senior pastor at Sac Central Church. Well, thank you very much, and glad uh, we're able to sing together like that. Thank you, choristers. Uh, always a nice job singing as you do, and everyone sounded really nice here this morning. Glad that you, uh, you're you joining us, and those that are tuning in, whether you're watching us on 3ABN Proclaim or First Light Broadcast, our YouTube channel or our website, glad that you're tuning in. Uh, we have a special offer for everyone who's uh, viewing, uh, and today's offer is C21837, and you just need to call 916 
7 6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org and we'll be happy to get that out to you. It's a presentation, this presentation on CD or DVD, I'll just give us your full address. This is for those living in North American territories. So glad that you're joining us and uh, we've been journeying together with the Apostle Paul and uh, today we're in lesson number 11, Arrest in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, sounds ominous, and it certainly is. So let's read our memory text. It's from Acts 23, verse 11, and it says, But the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, speaking about Paul, for you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And wasn't that Paul's desire to go ultimately to Rome? I'm not sure he envisioned that he'd go in chains, but uh, nonetheless, he was going to go to Rome, something he desired to do to share Christ with the people there. Uh, it, over and over again, as we review the life of Paul, you just understand that this man was passionate and fearless uh, in his desire to share the, the risen Christ with, uh, with individuals who uh, may not or had not heard of this, of this man, of this God-man, Jesus Christ. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, the story. It happened about 50 years ago. Uh, Bangladesh was uh, facing an incredible health crisis. Um, contamination of water sources throughout the country were causing an incredibly high rate of child mortality. And maybe some of you recall that. Um, there was about a quarter million children dying every year by the uh, infection, uh, the waterborne infectious diseases. So as a solution, international charities uh, organizations, they launched a massive humanitarian uh, effort to bring cleaner water to the country of Bangladesh. And what they did is they installed 10 million hand pumped wells that brought up water from uh, the deep underground. And that sounded on the surface like a great idea. It wasn't until more than 20 years later that scientists discovered how that well-intentioned plan actually backfired. Uh, though the underground water was free from the bacterial contamination of the surface sources, the water underneath was tainted with arsenic, and no one knew. And of course, arsenic is that toxic chemical that causes skin abrasion and cancer and other diseases. So a survey conducted by the World Health Organization, the WHO, found that as many as 77 million people, half the population of Bangladesh, were drinking water with levels of arsenic higher than the recommended safe limit. The WHO characterized the situation as, quote, the largest mass poisoning of a population in history. Of course, it was all unintentional. Good intentions with bad results. Um, and in this week's lesson, we learned that the leaders of the early church in Jerusalem also had good intentions, but the results were devastating to the Christian cause. And we're going to look at that here as we go to Acts chapter 21. And that's where we begin. We're looking at uh, 20, Acts 21, 22, and parts of 23 here this, uh, this morning. We've got a large ground to cover. We're just going to try to move right along. So you'll notice the red. The red uh, here is Paul's first missionary journey. So you can follow it there. You can see where he traveled. And then the green is his second missionary journey. We've been journeying with him. And you can see all around. He's Asia Minor, Greece, uh, etc. And then uh, back over. And then the third missionary journey is in blue. And you will see that he followed uh, nearly the same course as his second journey all the way around. And then uh, back over through here. And then uh, we're going to trace his steps, not necessarily today, but next week, Paul's journey to Rome. And you'll see that there in purple. The first three journeys were as a free man. But the last one was uh, in some ways against, uh, many ways against his will, but a part of his will because he desired to go to Rome. Uh, but uh, he didn't, uh, didn't see that, foresee that he'd go as a, a man chained and bound. Acts 21 verses 15 to 17. The Bible says... After those days, we packed and we went up to Jerusalem. Uh, you remember he was up there at Miletus. He talked to the, uh, the uh, called the leaders, the elders from the church in Ephesus to come down. He talked with them. He prayed. They hugged. They kissed. And they, he said farewell. Then he set sail and traveled toward Jerusalem. 
And, um, and so he says he packed, went to Jerusalem. And also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with us a certain uh, Manson of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. Um, the, uh, the original actually indicates that uh, he wasn't with them. He was there, uh, there where Paul and his companions were coming to lodge with him there. Verse 17, and when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And so Paul heads toward Jerusalem. He knows what his fate's going to be because you remember in earlier verses, a prophet comes to him and tells him that he's going to be bound in Jerusalem and uh, there he will become a prisoner uh, because uh, for the cause of Jesus Christ. So with some uh, trepidation, sadness, and even a sense of anticipation, Paul and his companions <clears throat> travel down to Jerusalem in time for the Passover. And of course, Paul's hope is that he can win his countrymen. That's his passion his desire. And of course, with him were gifts, gifts that had been collected from the, uh, the Gentile churches because of the famine down there in, in Judea. Judea. And he had all these gifts uh, given by the Gentile churches to this, this struggling church in Judea. And it was also his desire to unite, uh, bring a tighter union between the Jewish and the Gentile converts to Christianity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But uh, Paul, learning about his pl the plot on his life, he took a different course, delaying his arrival in Jerusalem. Uh, with Paul were several representatives from the giving Gentile churches, which you read about in Acts chapter 20 verse 4, and these individuals were brought as tokens of the work of the Holy Spirit, the work that he was doing uh, among the Gentiles, and these individuals were bearing the gifts to the church there in Jerusalem. So although he wanted to get there in time for Passover, he had to delay the trip because of the plot on his life, and he ended up making his way down there later. He was seeking to get down there in time for the Passover, uh, for the for Pentecost. So several, uh, let's go to Acts 21 verses 18 to 21. Let's take a look here at several verses and let's continue the story. And so the leaders in Jerusalem uh, greet him. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. James was the brother of Jesus and one of the uh, main leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And when he had greeted them, uh, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles throughout his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and they said to him, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. All right. So Paul meets with James. He meets with the, the leaders there in the church in Jerusalem. And what is he, what's the first thing he does? He reports. He shares uh, all the wonderful things that God has done uh, through his hand and, and, and others that have joined him uh, as they worked among the Gentiles because that was what he was called to do. He was called to minister and to share Christ among the Gentiles. And so he's sharing and relating. And the Bible says he related just bits and pieces. No, it says that uh, he related details, all of the things that uh, God was doing, all the mighty things that he was doing among the Gentiles. And the Bible records that we just read that the leaders praised, they rejoiced uh, in the Lord, they glorified God because of what, uh, what uh, God had done through uh, Paul and his uh, compatriots in sharing the gospel among the Gentiles. Now, but then something happens here, and you probably notice there's a change uh, in, the, in the conversation and even the disposition of the leaders, the leading uh, individuals in the, church of, in the church in Jerusalem toward Paul and his companions. They're praising God, they're rejoicing, but then they, uh, they switch gears, so to speak. They, uh, they suddenly change topic. Why? Why do they change the disposition toward Paul, especially especially after it was obvious that God had been doing some pretty powerful things among the Gentiles. Why was that? Well, let's just back up just a few moments and let's just get a little context and remind ourselves several years earlier, there was that big Jerusalem council, that big gathering of representatives from the churches around the area. And they, at that meeting, they gave careful consideration to questions concerning work among the Gentiles. 
the issue here was you had the Jewish converts to Christianity who insisted that the Gentiles uh, also be circumcised like they were. First, they needed to become a Jew before they become a Christian. And uh, so this created some real challenges. There was a meeting. They talked about these things. And at the end of the council, it was agreed to uh, recommend a plan that would promote unity among all the churches there. So at the same council, interestingly, everyone was united in commending Paul and Barnabas to take the letters from the Jerusalem council to share them with the Gentile churches. So they did that in good faith, but now Paul's back. They're giving him a hard time. Now, the issue here is that there were some prior prejudices toward the Gentiles among the Jewish converts that existed because there was, uh, there was great, uh, uh, there was a lot of um, hatred that existed in the hearts of the Jews toward the Gentiles. They thought themselves to be the elite and the Gentiles were dogs. They weren't. And even the Jewish, when they convert, the Jewish uh, uh, Christians, when they converted to Christianity, some of them still held some of these, uh, these prejudices. And even uh, their prejudices toward Paul's method of his labor among the, uh, among the Gentiles. So when they gathered here and they met, some were still cherishing some of these, uh, these feelings and felt that Paul was really largely responsible for the existing prejudices that, uh, that among some of the Jewish converts. But what they shared with Paul were rumors that were not true. And the, and the leaders in Jerusalem should have debunked those rumors long ago, but instead they used those false allegations to, uh, to try to encourage Paul to accept a compromise that would bring about what they perceived to be uh, unity uh, among the Jewish converts and the Gentiles. So it was false. We have a couple of verses here that, that talk about that. We'll notice Paul's message regarding, uh, regarding circumcision and what his message was. The accusation was that he was uh, telling people not to, what, was the, what were the specifics? To forsake Moses, saying that they ought not circumcise their children nor walk according to their customs. This was an exaggeration of the actual facts. Notice Paul's message, and, uh, and, and, let, me, and let me ask you, tell me whether, in fact, uh, what they said was true. Um, and it, it, you've read a number of Paul's letters uh, time and again. And frankly, you're just not going to see Paul telling folk to forsake Moses. Now, we'll clarify a few things here in just a minute. Colossians 3, 10 and 11, uh, Paul wrote this to the church there. He said, and have put on the new man, speaking about the, the converted individual, have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him, Jesus, who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, let me ask you the question here. Was Paul minimizing or doing away or saying, don't talk or don't listen to or, or, or don't accept the teachings of Moses? In the context of salvation, there was no more, well, a Greek was a Greek and a Jew was a Jew. A, a free man was a free man. A slave uh, was a slave. They were all still where they were. But in salvation, in the context of salvation, all come to Christ by faith. There are not two methods of salvation here. There's not two ways of salvation. As a matter of fact, Paul writing to the church in, in Galatia, and we studied that entire book here not too long ago, the burden of his message was that there are not two ways of salvation. There, are not, there is not righteousness by works and righteousness by faith. And, um, and what Paul is saying here is whether a person circumcised or uncircumcised, we all come to Christ on the same terms. And in Christ, we're all the same. We're all considered equal in his eyes. No one, uh, no one can claim to be better, more important, more prestigious. At the foot of the cross, it's a level playing field, you see. Now, Galatians 5 verse 6. Dane, thank you. Let's read another one here. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision, of, circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Okay, and you can compare that with Galatians six fifteen, where Paul essentially says the same thing, and um, and says it doesn't. These things don't amount to much, but a new creature does. So what was Paul saying? The important thing here was not whether you were circumcised or uncircumcised, but whether you'd given your heart to Jesus. 
whether you'd come to Christ by faith. That was, his, uh, that was his key point. Now, it is true, it is true, that while he was preaching this way and sharing this message, it was undermining, it was undermining uh, the, the Jewish converts, uh, some of their, their, their uh, desire to push upon the Gentiles, the need to be circumcised before they were baptized to become Christians. And... Um, or baptized into Christianity. Uh, it did undermine it, but Paul never said not to listen to or ignore or, or, or directly to say, do not circumcise your children, who, nor, nor to walk according to the customs. It is true that it undermined uh, the, the need to be circumcised, because why? Circumcision was a sign that you were what? You were a Jew. You are a Jew. And the gospel now was going to the world. Now, of course, the gospel needed to go to the world uh, anyway, but the Jews had kept it to themselves. And so whether a person was circumcised or not didn't matter. The question or the issue was whether you'd come to Christ by faith. That was the issue. And it's a very important point for us to consider as well. There is no other way to receive salvation except through Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. A uh, person can do all types of good things in the hope that they'll earn salvation, but it will avail them nothing. We come to Christ through faith. And then the grace that we receive by faith works in us then to will and to do of God's good pleasure. You see, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace that leads to good works. What do you say out there? Yeah, sure. All right. So instead of coming to Paul's defense, the uh, leaders there in Jerusalem sought to compromise, to reach a compromise by counseling Paul to take a certain course of action that they personally believed would remove all concern among some of the Jewish converts. So let's take a look here at uh, verses 22 to 24 and let's read what they recommended. So what then? The assembly, uh, the assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So to... Uh, show that the rumors circulating about Paul and his teachings were wrong, Paul was asked to do something very Jewish. And that was to sponsor the Nazarite vow of some of the Jewish believers, four particular men. So Paul was essentially advised to be politically correct. That's what he was advised to do. And because of his desire to be in harmony with his brethren, and uh, I'm going to just share some thoughts from Acts of the Apostles here. These are, there are four areas that led Paul to, to do what he, uh, he knew in his mind he really shouldn't have done. But there are four things that led him to it. Number one, his desire to be in harmony with his brethren there in Jerusalem. He really worked hard to be in harmony with them. Secondly, he had a sensitivity toward those that were weak in the faith. So those that were, uh, had a problem with Gentiles not being circumcised, he was sensitive to that. And he didn't want it to be a stumbling block, you see. And then he had a deference toward the apostles that had been with Jesus for three and a half years. And so he wanted to, he wanted to cooperate with them. And then Paul also worked, and you read this in Corinthians when he wrote to the church in Corinth, that he wanted to be all things to all people in order that they might what? be saved, that they might be one to the cross. So all of these things combined led Paul to follow the counsel that he knew in his mind and his heart wasn't the best counsel, but he, he decided to follow that. And although they were, it was good intentions, the results were disastrous. They were disastrous because essentially the church would lose the apostle Paul prematurely. So we don't blame Paul. <laughs> Others before him and after him made mistakes as well. Uh, we, we think of Abraham. He made some mistakes, didn't he? The father of all faith. Moses made, made a, a grievous mistake there before heading into Canaan. Uh, Elijah, he made uh, some mistakes. Discouragement got the better of him. Sometimes we, we often make mistakes ourselves. And so we don't, we're not too hard on the apostle Paul here. But what made Paul's actions especially troubling is that they contradicted everything that he had for uh, up to this point taught and, and wrote and preached and lived. See, behind, that, behind the council was a legalistic motive. 
It was a legalistic motive. And so in accepting the legalistic motive, because he'd accepted the recommendation, he was thereby promoting two gospels, something that he had taught and preached against. So you can understand how devastating this could have been. Every, everything he said, everything he's proclaimed, now he's doing the very thing that he said wasn't necessary. And, uh, and it created some problems. Uh, so essentially he was saying that there was two ways to be saved, one for the Gentiles and one for the Jews, faith and works. And I'm quoting from Acts of the Apostles, page 405. She says, instead of accomplishing the desired object, his efforts for conciliation precipitated the crisis, hastened his predicted sufferings, and resulted in his being separated from the church, depriving the church of one of its strongest pillars and bringing sorrow to Christ, uh, Christian hearts in every land. So what was spearheaded with good intentions ended up becoming disastrous for the church. Even though Paul was going to go bound to Rome, it's, it was going to happen. Uh, he was going to be arrested at some point. It was premature and it, uh, and it affected the work of the church uh, early on. Good intentions with bad results. In our attempt to be somewhat relevant today, how can we be careful? And this is a question at the bottom of the lesson on uh, what day are we doing? Sunday's lesson. At the bottom of Sunday's lesson, in our attempts to be relevant, it says, how can we be careful not to make a similar kind of error? You know, uh, we, we want to reach people where they're at. We want to connect with them. We hope they connect with us so we can then share the wonderful uh, wonders of the, of the gospel and the truth that God has committed to his last day church. How can we, the question is, in our attempts to be relevant, how can we be careful not to make a similar kind of error? I, I would just simply, uh, in, in my mind, as I was looking at that question, I just wrote down a few things. One of them was don't bend over backwards to please other people. Um, there, sometimes there are individuals that may have a disposition to bend over backwards for other people. It may be in their heart, it may be their disposition. Some people might just see it as, as the path of least resistance and an e therefore an easier way. And so they take that course as well, but it ends up being disastrous. So instead, we should always keep our heads on our shoulders, irrespective of maybe the pressure that may come to bear, uh, or, uh, and also stay steady, keep our eyes focused on Christ, send up a prayer. And instead of being hasty to make a decision, consider if a proposed course of action would contradict or undermine your faith. You know, I've pr probably shared this before, but I know individuals where, uh, you know, at Seventh-day Adventist and uh, they, uh, they advocate for the healthy lifestyle and uh, not to eat unclean and drink wine and or alcoholic beverages and the rest. Um, by the way, you probably saw uh, in the news that uh, a worldwide study just came out regarding the use of alcohol. Zero benefits. Zero. And we knew that. God's word shared. He that, he that uh, strong, strong drink is a mocker, the Bible says, and he that participates, partakes of it is unwise. Uh, God's looking for wise people in these last days, not to, not to, not to touch that stuff. Anyway, just a, a side note um, and, uh, and another affirmation that God's word is true. Uh, didn't need science to tell us that, but uh, we, we, we know it. And science now knows it and people are, uh, maybe some of them are coming to their senses. Anyway, um, so advocates for not imbibing alcohol and the like, but, but in an attempt and in an effort to reach people where they're at when they visit individuals in their homes, they will eat the foods that they say shouldn't be eaten and they'll drink the drinks and maybe just a sip of the, of, this, of the drink that they say they shouldn't be drunk. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that an effective witness? It's all in an effort not to offend. It's all in an effort not to offend. But is that an effective witness? Now, as a matter of fact, in, your, in, a, in an effort, in the effort not to offend, what has a person done? They've undermined their witness. And now they've, they've really shattered, well, I shouldn't say shattered, but they've really hindered their witness to that individual. And that, that person is looking now saying, but you believe this, you think this, you've said this, but now you're doing this. And you could talk about it on multiple different levels, couldn't you? And, uh, and make it the application. So we send up a prayer, take time to consider, make sure that our course of action is not going to undermine or, or contradict our, our, our course of action, what, we've, uh, what we understand from the Word of God, the direction that we've been following, and what we've, uh, what we've shared with others uh, regarding our faith. So wonderful lessons, things that we can learn from Paul's encounter. We're not hard on Paul. Uh, we've got lessons to learn ourselves, uh, but it's unfortunate that, uh, that he accepted the counsel. And it's unfortunate 
that they gave him that counsel, but that's how it was. Let's go to Monday's lesson. Let's continue to see here what developed now. Acts 21, 26 to 36. Acts 21, 26 to 36. Um, let's read together here. It says, Then Paul took the men, so he accepted the counsel, he took the men, the four men, the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, and if you recall, the Jews from Asia were hard on Paul's trail, uh, trail. Uh, they, they made his life difficult. They happened to be there in Jerusalem. For days, Paul was coming in and out of the temple, no problem. But later on, the, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd. And they laid hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. <laughs> All right, so he accepts the, the church leader's suggestion. Paul would, Paul would need to undergo seven days of purification to assist in the completion of the men's vows. You can read about that in Numbers 19, verses 11 through 13. Also, uh, just remember and keep in mind that anyone coming from a Gentile land was not to enter the precincts of the temple uh, or, uh, or uh, it would be problematic. Um, so a riot ensued based on what? False allegations and rumors. That's exactly right. Yeah. Because Paul had brought with him uh, tro tro uh, Trophimus. Trophimus was his name. He was a believer from Ephesus. It was assumed by the Asian Jews that they had brought, he had brought him into the temple. And that wasn't the case. Paul did not take him into the temple. It was a crime punishable with death. So what they did was they stirred up, these people stirred up the natural prejudices of the people. And if it hadn't been for the swift action of the Roman commander Claudius Lysias... Paul would have been killed right there and then. That would have been the end of it. You know, you just think back a few years earlier at the trial of Jesus. What happened there? I mean, the, the mob, they were just, they were just uh, rallied to a frenzy, weren't they? Uh, just uh, stirred up into a frenzy. And it resulted in Jesus' death. You know, today, it's easy to get caught up in believing false reports and just for a moment, I want to suggest even getting sucked into jumping on the media hype train. You know, 24 hour news cycle, they've got to come up with news for 24 hours. And sometimes they just pummel a, a point and uh, have all types of different opinions. And it's easy for people to just kind of get all caught up and sucked up into the media hype train. They all aboard and they join. People easily take sides today without considering or getting the facts. And their positions are generally found on hearsay and uh, rumor. But God's people today need to rise above that. We need to think critically and we need to not succumb to group think. Because it's group think that when you read Revelation, it's group think that will lead the, the world to worship. The beast will, uh, 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 the world will wander after the beast. And then they will persecute those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast. It's this group think. And so we need to be careful we don't get in, into this group think mentality. It's always important to verify the facts. And, uh, and let me just say this too. You don't always have to have an opinion on, any, on everything. There's too many things, too many issues out there. Who cares, right? Sometimes, who cares? Don't always have to have an opinion. If you don't know, you don't know. It's okay. But let me say this as well. It must, we must be very, very careful not to be promoters of false reports, even in the church. Um, by, uh, by, and, and, and by giving ear to false rumors and then sharing those things. This is deadly and, and, and can be devastating to the church. Um, but let's go to Proverbs 16, 28 regarding false reports, rumors, and false allegations. Notice what the wise man says here. Uh, Proverbs 16, 28. He says, a perverse man, what type of man? Perverse man, strong words. What do they do? They sow strife. They strow strife and discord. And notice a whisperer separates friends. What was that you said? What was that? Get closer. Can't hear you. And, uh, you know, you've probably had someone come whisper in you. And, and you know, it, it's, our, it's our nature to go, what? Huh? Hey, hey, say that again. And um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, we're kind of hungry for, for, for gossip sometimes. Uh, but a whisperer separates friends. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever guards his mouth... And his tongue keeps his soul from troubles. That reminds me of what James wrote. If you don't bridle your tongue, then your religion's worthless. 
um, you know, very strong counsel. Exodus 21 verse 3, you shall not, this is a you shall not, you shall not circulate a false report. So if you don't want to circulate a false report, be sure what you're circulating isn't a false report. But just don't circulate any, anything anyway, uh, lest, especially if you don't know anything about what you're circulating. Just keep it to yourself. Let, let rumors end with you. What do you say out there? Let them just end right here. So you shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. And so, uh, you know, you know, the Adventist grapevine is a pretty, pretty powerful thing. And sometimes things get shared that aren't true and uh, unfortunate. You know, it's, it's, it was unfortunate. There was a rumor uh, circulating when Pastor Doug left Sacramento Central. We kicked him out. That's, that was a rumor that was circulating. And, uh, and that's unfortunate. Another, circ- another rumor circulating is that, uh, that's, that Granite Bay Church is now no longer going to be a part of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is another false rumor, not, uh, not true in the slightest. Uh, they're, they're the prodigy or a child of this church, and uh, they, uh, they're, a, they're a part of the sister of churches. Uh, in this conference, and they'll always be that way. So there's false rumors that spread all over the place. The worst type of rumors to spread, though, is regarding regarding the truth of God's word. And so in the church, um, even though this is God's remnant church, and he raised this church up to proclaim a very pointed message to the world, prepare them for the hour of judgment and also for the coming of the Lord, there are false reports, that rumor, that go through the church, untruths about new time prophecies and date setting and feast days and the name of God and different strange teachings that surface every now and then. And they're designed to, to try and challenge God's people. And, uh, and I just ask and I pray that we would be faithful to God's word and that we would not allow false reports to circulate, but stay by the stuff, hold to the truth of God's word and uphold, uphold the truth of God's word and don't let false reports circulate. Uh, always uphold the truth of God's word. Be a defender of the faith. What do you say? Yeah, truly. Now, we didn't get to Proverbs 26.20. I'm getting excited here. So, Pam, go right ahead. All right, Proverbs 26.20. Where there is no wood... The fire goes out, mm-hmm. and where there is no t- tail bearer, strife ceases. Yeah. So you want the it's cold night. You've got the fire going in your home, or maybe you have a little pit outside, and you're putting wood in the fire, and it just continues to flame that fire, doesn't it? And then uh, you want to stay out there longer, but you run out of wood. What happens to the fire? It ends up going out. That's exactly right. It ends up going out, and uh, and that's the same thing here. When someone shares, uh, when someone shares false reports. Uh, when there is no one to, uh, no tail bearer, what happens to strife? It ceases. That's right. All right. So let the rumors end with you. What do you say out there? Hmm. Let's go to Tuesday before the crowd, before the crowd. Let's go to verse now 20, uh, 37. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Verse 37 before the crowd. And uh, this is chapter 21. Chapter 21. So Paul is arrested. He is uh, taken to the uh, he's taken to the barracks. And let's read verse 37. Then, as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, and he said to the commander, "May I speak to you?" He replied, "Can you speak Greek?" Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Look at the result of false rumors and reports. Paul was accused of being some, uh, some marauder and uh, some re- rebel against the Romans, uh, leading these uh, 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness. But Paul said, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no, citizen of no mean city or, or uh, of a prominent city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. Verse 40. So when he had stood his, when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and mentioned or motioned rather with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, and we'll look at that in a moment. So even though, and I just want you to picture this, even though the crowd were clamoring for Paul's death out of genuine love and out of genuine concern for his fellow Jews, he asked the commander for permission to even talk to them. Now, now, my natural inclination would be, can you get me out of here and out of here fast? But Paul said, no, wait, if you don't mind, I want to talk to them. So after confirming that he was not this Egyptian rebel, but instead a Jew from Tarsus, the commander gave him permission to speak to the people. And what Paul goes on to say, and we'll actually read chapter 20. Let's look at verse uh, chapter 22. Let's look at verse 1. 
He said, brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when he had heard that they spoke, when they had heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew, uh, they kept all the more silent. And then what did Paul do? What was Paul's defense uh, according to these verses? Instead of convincing them with some theological statement, what did Paul do? Yep. Paul shared his personal conversion story instead. Uh, why did Paul choose to focus on his conversion story instead of opening the scriptures to the people's minds and giving, giving them a Bible study? Why did he decide to give his personal conversion story first? Well, essentially, he was hoping to, to disarm them. And if a person is disarmed, then they're more inclined to listen to the truth. So he was seeking to disarm them. He, didn't, he did that by letting them know that he, how he, he understood how they felt about the way. Because hadn't Paul felt the same way about Christians earlier? In so much that he was consenting to their death. He was persecuting the Christians. And so he was after them. <laughs> he was after them. So he starts by saying, I understand. I was there. I was, persecute, I was even persecuting the Christians. And he wanted them to understand, and he goes on to share his conversion story. He wanted them to understand that after such a traumatic encounter on the road to Damascus, where he encountered the resurrected Christ, that he had no other choice but to surrender his heart to Jesus. In other words, he was saying, what, what choice did I have? If you had the similar experience as I had had, wouldn't you do the same thing? And, this, and he was seeking to explain why he had changed so much from being a persecutor of the church to be an apostle of the church. He first tried to disarm them, I understand. And then he sought to help them understand why he had surrendered his heart to Jesus. Let me suggest to us today, what more convincing argument do we have than to share the ability to share our personal experience with Christ, uh, with Christ to others? That's a, that's a powerful way to convince individuals regarding, uh, regarding Christ and his truth. If you've encountered Jesus, then tell your story. It's a great way to disarm and to break down barriers and prejudice and, uh, and not just relate your story, but live your story. Let people see Jesus in your life and how you treat them and handle situations. And so Paul shared his story. Now, let's go to chapter 22, verses 22 to 29. Notice. And they listened to him until this word. Now, what word was that? Look at verse 21. He's talking about his story and he said to them, and he's quoting uh, Christ, depart for I will send you far from here, talking to Paul, I will send you far from here to who? The Gentiles. So up to this point, every, they're listening. <clears throat> up to this point, they're all ears. They're hearing Paul's conversion story. They're in rapt attention. But the moment he says that Jesus called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles, what happened according to chapter uh, 22, verse 22? And they listened to him until this word, and they, then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he's not fit to live. I mean, don't just take him out of here, but just get rid of him completely. Take him out of here. He's not fit to live on this earth. So the crowd listened up to the point that Paul mentioned his calling to share Christ with the Gentiles. This is interesting. And that was enough for them to come undone. Not th the things that he'd mentioned before, but that point. Prejudice and bigotry. Prejudice and bigotry. And it ran very, very deep in their hearts. And you know, it still runs deep in some people's hearts today. And I'm not just referring to race, racism. I'm not just referring to racism. The Jews felt that they were the only ones entitled to the privileges of salvation. They felt they were the only ones entitled. And it didn't take long for the Jews to erect barriers between them and the Gentiles from learning about God's plan of salvation. They were, they were viewed, the Jews viewed the Gentiles as unworthy, unworthy of receiving this knowledge. And uh, they mistakenly believed salvation was simply of the Jews. That, my friends, is called spiritual bigotry or religious bigotry. Uh, and we need to stay clear of that. Thinking that we're better because we've been entrusted with truth leads to barrier building. It's just what happens. When you start thinking that you are better than others, you, it leads to barrier building. Uh, we are the ones who begin then to determine who becomes worthy of hearing about the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Who's worthy to hear about the gospel? No one's worthy. 
No one. But Christ's death made it so that we would be, be accounted worthy to receive and hear, hear and receive the gospel. For sure. And so, being entrusted with truth shouldn't lead us to make us feel better than others. It should lead us to recognize the incredible weight of responsibility that rests on us to share with those who do not know. It actually should lead us to a more humble condition because we're not fulfilling the responsibilities God has given to us as his church. We're not doing all that God has asked us to do. And I think if we looked in our own personal lives, uh, we wrestle with this and we say, God, am I doing everything I can? Are you, am, I, am I taking advantage of every moment? And I think the answer would be probably not. And we say, God, forgive me, help me. A new, day's, a new day, is it today is a new day. Help me, help me uh, do what I didn't do yesterday. And we're asking God to help us each and every day. So we, we have a greater res- responsibility because we've been entrusted with the truth. should make us feel better than other people. Or no, but more accountable to them. And that's how Paul felt in his ministry. He felt accountable, responsible to others. That's why he did what he did and went to great lengths to do what he did. If anyone didn't deserve to hear the truth because of the way they behaved on that day, it was the mob who were about to destroy Paul. But Paul provides us with a wonderful example of how the Jews ought to have treated the Gentiles. But more than this, he gives us an example of God's grace. God's grace. Grace is for those who don't deserve it. Grace is not for those who think they deserve it. It's for those who don't deserve it. May God help us to exhibit God's grace in our lives. What do you say out there? Yeah. Romans chapter 5 verses 6 through 8 reminds us of the incredible grace that God has toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm getting ahead of myself because Mike's going to read that for us in just a little bit. But I just want you to think about this for a moment. Paul's being mistreated, but then he wants to still share his story so that they might receive Jesus at last. Grace. They were undeserving. They were treating him bad, but still he exhibited grace. And that's an ex- exhibition of God's grace for those, uh, for us, for planet Earth. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Okay, Romans 5, 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, mm-hmm. in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, beautiful words. Even though we were rebelling against God, even though we were, we were pushing back on God, God sent his son into the world to die for us. That's grace. Let's go to Wednesday's lesson. Before the Sanhedrin, uh, the Roman commander didn't really see Paul as a threat to society. So he determined this for the Sanhedrin to figure it out because they saw that it was a religious matter. And he said, okay, we'll, we'll set it up. You can go down to the Sanhedrin. And the first verse of chapter 23, it says, Paul, looking earnestly at the council, the Sanhedrin, uh, said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So Paul's statement concerning a good conscience was a subtle rebuke to the religious leaders whose consciences had been violated over and over and over again because of the bad and poor choices that they had made. For that, what happened to Paul? The Bible says that they went to strike him. However, knowing the law, he rebuked the high priest for commanding something contrary to what the law allowed. And when someone said, do you dare talk to the high priest that way? Paul said, well, I didn't know it was the high priest. And that, I'm not sure how we can account for that, except maybe he couldn't quite see because, of, uh, because he suffered with, with some t- degree of blindness, perhaps. Uh, some see in the statement a facetious statement that if the high priest had ordered for Paul to be struck, then it wouldn't be the high priest that would order that because he knows the law. So I didn't know it was the high priest that would give such orders. Uh, but maybe it's more that it has to do with his eyesight more than anything. So the Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees uh, who were opposed to each other on a number of different theological issues. A major point of contention that existed between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was the issue of the resurrection the resurrection. You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. Uh, they were the, the liberals in the, uh, in the church, so to speak, that believed, <clears throat> didn't believe that uh, what the word of God taught or said when it came to these spectacular things. And they certainly didn't believe in the resurrection. So Paul ingenu- ingenuously, uh, ingeniously used this subject 
to distract or disrupt the proceedings. But it was more than just a tactic for Paul. The subject of the resurrection of Christ lay at the very foundation of his own conversion. And, uh, and the reason he was being judged, because he believed that Christ had appeared to him, the resurrected Christ had appeared to him, and he was being charged for uh, his, uh, his uh, proclamation of the gospel that Jesus had told him to share. So nothing else really could explain why this change in Paul's life, except that Jesus had met him, the resurrected Christ. And I'd like to suggest to us this morning that the resurrection lays at the foundation of our lives as well, of our Christian lives. We don't serve a Christ who hangs upon a cross. We serve a Christ who is risen, who ascended to heaven, who there ministers in heaven's temple for you and for me today. What do you say? Yeah, it's wonderful. So Christ has risen and, and, has, and lives forevermore. And, uh, and if he didn't rise, then we would be of all men most ris- miserable. Paul even said that our faith would be in vain. And so we thank the Lord that he rose. Uh, Paul said in Romans 4.25 that he was raised for our justification. Without Christ's resurrection, you and I wouldn't receive the blessing of justification. We, we don't get it from the cross. We get it from his resurrection. And um, anyway, things to consider, points to ponder. So later, while reflecting on his trying experiences that day, he was uh, he was kind of uh, taken out of the assembly there because there was a whole bunch of squabbling and uh, and fighting between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. While he was uh, reflecting on that those experiences, uh, who came to encourage Paul himself personally? Look at Acts twenty three verse eleven. But he he the following night. Uh, But the following night, rather, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. So to all those who live for and serve Christ, his abiding presence through the Holy Spirit should be reassurance and comfort to us as well. Jesus himself came to Paul. Isn't that encouraging? Yeah, it's like Daniel. Jesus himself came to Daniel to encourage him. Jesus himself stood in that fiery furnace with those three Hebrew worthies when they'd been thrown into, the, into that fiery furnace because they refused to bow down before that great uh, statue in the plain of Dura, Nebuchadnezzar's statue of gold. Um, Christ comes to us and encourages us. I want to look at a few verses, just promises for us to remember here. Um, someone's got Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. Okay, Jan, we'll come to you in just a moment. Let's first go to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Notice, Jesus said, and he spoke to them, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you every so often. (laughs) No, it wouldn't be a great promise if it was that. I am with you always, even till the end of the earth. Isn't that beautiful? And, uh, and then it closes by saying, Amen. Amen. John 16, verse 7, verse 7 says, Nevertheless, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the help of the comforter, the other comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. In other words, while I'm here, you have no desire for the other comforter, the other paraclete, the, the Holy Spirit to come. But if I go, you'll desire his presence and I'll be with you always through the presence of the Holy Spirit who can be uh, everywhere at once. And so uh, we have a great gift in the Holy Spirit who's come to, uh, to be with us and aid us and help us and comfort and, and strengthen us. And then Hebrews 13 verse 5 and 6, Jan. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. Amen. It's one of my favorite promises. My favorite promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Thursday's lesson transferred to Caesarea. Acts 23 verses 12 through uh, 30 describe a plot, 40 men who had conspired to kill Paul. Uh, They asked the religious leaders to have Paul come back to the Sanhedrin the next day. They said, we'll lie in wait and we'll kill him. And uh, providentially, Paul's nephew heard about the plot he was right in the right place at the right time. Providentially, he heard about this plot and he went to Paul. And Paul said, go to the commander and tell him all that you've heard. And, uh, and so what did, what happened here? What happened here? 
um, because Paul's continued presence in Jerusalem might lead to some dangerous consequences in the city, even perhaps his own life, Claudius Lysias decided to transfer Paul from his jurisdiction to that of Felix, the governor or the procurator. And so uh, because Roman law uh, fully protected its citizens who had a right to a legal trial and fair trial where they could defend themselves, by the way, even, even if the trial they felt wasn't fair, they could appeal to Caesar or to uh, the emperor. Um, Paul was protected by this law as he was transferred uh, from uh, Claudius down to Felix, just in case that band of 40 individuals learned of his relocation and sought to do him harm. And it's quite a contingency of individuals that went with Paul, uh, horsemen and uh, bowmen and uh, just uh, and cavalry all went there with Paul to bring him down to Felix, where Felix would then keep him safe and uh, in prison and wait for his accusers to come to meet him, where then he'd be given a trial. And so here is where we end the lesson, where Paul uh, is taken to Felix, and we'll pick that up next week when we study together. But I want you to remember here as we close this study that God's provident, providential leadings, if we allow him, will guide us and lead us. Sometimes it will be, it will be, uh, it will be great and it will be marvelous and wonderful. And other times it'll be difficult and it'll be challenging, but it's all designed to grow us, to keep us close to Jesus and prepare for his soon return. God wants us saved at last more than anything else. And I want you to remember here too, as I share a couple of closing verses, uh, Psalm uh, Isaiah, these are both from Isaiah chapter 59, verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the West and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Beautiful promise. So when, when the enemy sought to do away with Paul, Paul was protected by Roman authorities from those uh, who sought to do him harm. And you can understand how Paul must have felt about this. He was his Jewish, the Jewish brethren, those who had been entrusted with so much light, seeking to do him harm. And who was protecting him? The pagans. Those that the Jews should have been reaching with the gospel, but weren't. How embarrassing and how challenging. So, but God preserved Paul's life. Isaiah 54, verse 17, no weapon formed against you shall what? Prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment shall you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and your righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And so we can be encouraged today that God is with his people, that he'll protect and preserve his people. He'll allow us to go through challenges and difficulties. Um, yea, I would even say that some may lose their life for Christ, but it's all in his great plan, and we have an eternity to look forward to. This is but just a short period of time uh, here on planet Earth, between a, a we just our, our life is like a dash. You've seen those tombstones; they have the beginning date and then the ending date, and there's a dash in between. That's our life. It's a dash. It's like it's like breath, like a, like the grass of the field. Here today, gone tomorrow, but we have a great eternity to look forward to. Eternity provided through Jesus Christ. We can trust Him. We can know He will help us. And we know we have the presence of Jesus with us through the Holy Spirit always. What do you say out there? Amen. So for those that have joined us today, we're so glad that you did. Don't forget to call in for your free offer. It's offer C21837. Call 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sackcentral.org. And we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless. 